Welcome to our first evangelism and follow-up workshop uh, brought to you by the uh, outreach ministry. Um, the hope and the prayer from this is that uh, any anxiety associated with articulating your faith will be dealt with in our discussion. Um, any any ways that you've heard uh, evangelism communicated in some of the interesting but uh, faulty methods employed, we pray for, pray that uh, God would be pleased to to navigate us through that. And for any that um, may have a false notion about their salvation, maybe you've heard the gospel wrong, and because of that, you've embrace something that isn't the gospel prayerfully that we can be so clear um, that you would not only be encouraged but your hearts would be instructed and you would be drawn oh so closer to the Lord so what I did with um, my task of doing the evangelism piece is I have a number of books on evangelism that I wanted to go through and pull out some seed thoughts. There was no reason for me to kind of remake the wheel when God has blessed us with so many gifts mm -hmm. to the church. Mm -hmm. And so I drew from those various uh, resources to kind of bring out some differing insights. The last time I um, had an opportunity to teach on evangelism, um, I made a strong focus on the theological to make sure that we understood the gospel rightly. Um, I'll do a bit of that, but I'll um, expand more so on methods, um, methods that aren't just us going and bringing out some sort of catchphrase, but more of a method um, of having a, a culture of evangelism, understanding that evangelism is actually um, a series of conversations, it's dialogue, it's a back and forth that you have. Uh, so there's so there, there are definitions of evangelism that have um, put a great deal of emphasis on the end result of evangelism, meaning if nothing happens from the standpoint of I share the gospel, no one gets converted, then maybe I didn't really evangelize. There are some definitions that kind of squeeze the end result in there to that point that makes us performance oriented. Uh, the Bible, when it speaks about evangelism, gears us more toward the faithful task of doing it, the faithful task of communicating it. The results of evangelism fall within God's ballpark. Now, the scriptures are very clear about man being dead in trespasses and sins. So if someone is dead spiritually, they don't live within the realm of life unto God. So no matter what you do in your efforts, you cannot force someone to come to saving faith. Um, that part is in God's ballpark. He changes the heart. We're responsible for faithfully communicating the message. Okay? Mm -hmm. Before I launch in, I want to share some resources with you. Uh, a really good resource is The Heart of Evangelism by Jerem Bars. I think I shared that before. Um, how to Give Away Your Faith by Paul Little. I'll put them on the table. You don't have to worry about writing down the titles rapidly. Um, the Gospel and Personal Evangelism by uh, Mark Dever, Pastor Mark Dever. Uh, he's a pastor of a church in Washington, D.C. And Get Real, Sharing Your Everyday Faith Every Day by John S. Leonard. So um, during the break, you have an opportunity to take a look at the books. I'll have them on the side or someone will be able to put them on the side. Uh, the other thing is I was actually able to grab some booklets called Two Ways to Live. I know we made some copies, but uh, these will be available on the side for you to grab some for yourself and hand out the hand out for folks. Um, I think first we need to have uh, Miss Jenny stamp the back, but um, they will be available for you to um, to distribute. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So evangelism. What is our definition of evangelism? We could uh, press down the definition of evangelism to evangelism is teaching the gospel with an aim to persuade. Evangelism is teaching 
the gospel with an aim to persuade. This comes from uh, J. Jack J. Max Stiles' book on evangelism, and he actually took sort of an amplified Bible approach to expanding on that definition. He then expanded that definition to evangelism is teaching, and in parentheses, he defines teaching as heralding, proclaiming, preaching the gospel, and he has gospel in parentheses, is the message from God that leads us to salvation with the aim or hope, desire, goal to persuade, and in parentheses, convince, convert. Let me give that to you again to see if there's any questions from that definition. Evangelism is teaching, heralding, proclaiming, preaching. The gospel, which is the message from God that leads us to salvation with the aim, hope, desire, goal to persuade, convince, convert. Any questions from that definition? I'm actually going to define gospel. He gives a really good definition of gospel as well. So while in the early portion I said that a lot of the definitions about evangelism have the end result, the changed heart, packed in there, almost suggesting that we have the ability to provoke that sort of change. This seems to, but it's from the standpoint of the way we go about it. So as I'm looking to share the gospel with someone, I'm not just having some sort of general conversation, but I'm having a general conversation that hopefully will have a transforming effect. That there, Therefore, I'm able to say that a part of evangelism is an aim to persuade. It doesn't put all of the ability to persuade in my ballpark, but I have a responsibility to communicate it and at the end of it say, is there anything that will prohibit you from embracing Christ today? Mm-hmm. So that would be your aim and the exercise of persuading. The pastor always likes to say this when, it, when he speaks about evangelism and witnessing. There's a lot of folks who say, well, I evangelize with my life. I'm, I'm a living testimony. Paul said we are epistles written by God, read of men. And that's my, my evangelism. And that's true. But a piece of evangelism is teaching. And there's no evangelism without words. I mean, you're demonstrating with your life and you don't want to be a hypocrite and live in a way that contradicts the gospel. But you have to open up your mouth and, real, and, and, and communicate to folks the truth of the gospel. The scriptures are very clear that General or natural revelation does not tell us about Christ dying on the cross. If we look at the, the beauty of nature, we look at uh, the, the, the way that nature has a certain design to it that does not immediately tell us that uh, we are sinners in need of a Savior. It tells us that there is a creator. It tells us that there's uh, um, an intelligent creator with an intelligent design. But we need special revelation captured in the scriptures to communicate the truth of who God is. So without someone actually articulating the words of salvation found in the Bible, a man, a woman, a child cannot figure out salvation all but on their own. So evangelism requires the use of words. Communicating the gospel. Under the gospel, we could say that we find ourselves making the gospel too small by thinking only that it is something that gets us saved. That is, we communicate it as fire insurance. We communicate it without understanding that it has implications for life. Now, as I said, that we make the gospel too small because we only communicate it as something that just merely gets us saved. When we say that the the gospel gets us saved, we say that the gospel is the door unto salvation. Okay? But those who enter in that door, 
we know that if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. What does that tell us? That tells us that there are implications for life. God changes the heart and therefore you live differently. So the gospel is not only the doorway, but it's also the doorway to life or unto salvation. But it's the pattern for life as well. Any questions about that? Because I got a a good number of faces on that. (laughs) When you say pattern, Derek, you mean the process, the living out? Well, um, it is the living out. Yes, yes, that's a part of it. So it's it's us being changed, entering into union with Christ, being born again. So that has a transforming effect on us. And as a result of that, there's a change in me. I love what he loves. I hate what he hates. I have a different perspective on my sin. I may still have some bents toward it, but I have no comfort in it like I used to. Why? Because the gospel has changed me in that way. God, by his spirit, using the gospel, has changed me so that I don't indulge in things that I used to indulge in and have a certain measure of comfort in it. See that? Mr. Ronald. Okay. Derek, when you said uh, a few minutes earlier, when we look for end result, mm-hmm. you know, uh, once we have uh, given the gospel, and are you saying that, like you say, is there any reason that you cannot come to Christ today or now? Mm-hmm. Is Are you saying we should... Um, do that and vote that part of it as well? Yes. Yes. So I said two things. One of the things I said was us putting the pressure on ourselves, expecting that we are the ones that can change the heart based on a convincing argument. We don't have that ability. Right. Um, definitions on evangelism that put the ball in our court as the one who can change the heart leads to faulty evangelistic methods. Years ago, there was a man named Charles Finney. He was initially a lawyer by trade who became this well-known evangelist. He started to implement certain things in um, his evangelistic uh, meetings. Uh, One of the things that he had was the center's bench. The center's bench was at the front of the church. And so what they would do during the course of the service as he came down to the end is they would put a good deal of pressure on those believers that were in the congregation to encourage their unsaved friends that may have come out with them to take that walk down to the center's bench. And while those folks were on the center's bench, they would continue to do the hard sell on them to put them to the point of, I can't take it anymore. Because you had to sit on the center's bench until you responded. Mm -hmm. So after a while, people would respond to the gospel message, so to speak, just to get off that bench. (laughs) Because everybody in the church is looking at them. Mm -hmm. And the minister's up there, y'all not praying with me, they're not getting up. And pressuring them. So his thought was, if he could create a convincing enough argument, or if he could create an environment that was comfortable and uncomfortable enough for folks, psychologically, they would respond to the gospel. And that was his idea of getting people saved. He was presenting a pressure-packed, convincing argument. Like you go to the car dealership and you just want something that moves. Something that moves and breaks down. Now, all of a sudden, you know, 10 minutes go by. And they say, okay, do you have uh, a trade-in? It's like, oh, yeah, yeah, sure, I have a trade-in. Can I hold the keys? We want to check it out. All right, sure. So then they take your keys, and they take your keys in the back to the manager. And after two hours has passed, you feel frustration rising up in you. But they can't get to the manager, so they tell you to get your keys. And they're just saying, bear with me, bear with me. All of a sudden, three hours has passed. This pressure sale continues to build on you. 
After a while, you've got a car with navigation in it. You got the backup camera in it. You got a sunroof. You got a moonroof. You've got the uh, tricked out tires because they have pressured you into it. And there are some that use evangelism like that. They make the hard sell. The extremely hard sell. There are the evangelistic um, methods that people use in some of your big crusades or conferences. You see a stadium full of folks. And then they'll make the gospel play. And at the very end, there are volunteers that respond to the gospel plea to walk to the front of the church or walk to the front of the, the podium, the stand there. And so the people who may be on the fence about responding see the other people moving and sort of in a psychological crowd mentality, I feel comfortable in numbers. I'm no longer on the spot. Other people are moving. I want to be a part of that move. Look at that person moving and they're clapping. I want to feel validated. So these people move to the front. Why? Because they felt the Holy Spirit moving upon their heart. They felt some way about their sin. No, they saw the affirmation that other folks received as a result of the hand claps. And they move too. <clears throat> that is an evangelistic message that looks to a method based on the idea that I can change a heart with a convincing enough argument. See the difference? Yeah. Yeah. So if if I have if I have um, evangelism as teaching the gospel with an aim to persuade, then I'm looking to make clear and be honest about the idea that God created all things in beauty. In such amazing beauty that when he sat back and looked at his creation, he said, man, this is very good. Not a spot, not a wrinkle, nothing. And as I'm sharing that, the reality of the matter is that as this person's look, listening to me talk about the purpose and, and how God created all life, the thought ha has to be, as I look at life and as I look at this world, I don't see things like that anymore. I see riots. I see victimization. I see all manner of filth and evil. So what do you mean God created everything in, in beauty and, and goodness? Well, I'm glad you asked. Because this same God who created everything in beauty and, and, and in such glory and holiness set man on earth as a little king. God is big king with a capital K. Man is little king with a small K. He was supposed to be the steward over creation. But man, in his rebellion, opted to do things his own way. I don't need you, God. I hear your rules. I'm going to do my own thing. And as a result of that rebellion, there became a separation between God and man, throwing all of humanity into sin and the creation itself into sin. So that there is appointed a day when all men shall be judged. But God, in loving kindness, sent God the Son to live a perfect life in the room and in the place of guilty sinners. Living out this perfect life, he lived the life that I should have lived, but I didn't. Not only did he live out a perfect life, but he died on the cross, embracing the punishment that I am due. And he made this wonderful exchange. He took the righteousness that was comprised in his perfect life and gave me credit for it. And he took my sin and he took the blame for it. So that the father will pour out wrath unmixed with mercy on him. That's why we see the world the way we see it. And not only did he die and take on that condemnation, but three days later to confirm the truth of who he said he was, was the case. He rose again from the dead in all power. Making true or making real or showing us that he is who he said he was. And the same God, God the Son, who came down and lived the perfect life as a man, embraced a death of condemnation in our place and rose again, reaches out to us with outstretched hands saying, follow me. 
He looks for us as guilty sinners to repent of our sin and to embrace the provision that God has given unto them. Think about that. You're offensive to God, but he loves you. He loves you so much that he gave you the son of his love. Is there any reason why you wouldn't see yourself as a sinner, embrace his love, and ask God to change you today? I've just communicated, I've taught the gospel with an aim to persuade, but not saying that I can manipulate you into being changed. That's what you should be doing, not necessarily in those words, that's just one of the approaches, but you're looking to communicate the truth of the gospel. Not only do we make the gospel too small by looking at it as fire insurance, something that gets me in the door and and without understanding or communicating the implications that it has on life, namely that I repent of my sins. I see myself as a sinner. I repent of my sins. I believe unto salvation Uh, the provision that Christ has given me and God has changed my life, but we also bloat the gospel. We make it way too big. I should get faces from that. The reason why I say we bloat the gospel, or what that means is we add one thing to the gospel. Accepting Jesus is one thing, but in addition to accepting Jesus, you got to go to this church, you got to sing on the choir, You've got to do this. And if you don't do these number of things, then you're not saved. In addition to um, placing faith and and, and repentance in Christ, then you've got to give to the building fund, the church fund, uh, the pastor's love offering. We've got four of those. Um, And you've got to like, have you been by the pastor's house? You see them hedges? They ain't going to cut themselves. You got to cut them hedges. Like folks, add things, add works on. You've got to go door to door. And if you don't do all of these things, then you've missed out on salvation and adding things to it. Uh, The the, uh, writer, J. Max Style, says, we make the gospel too big when we say that the gospel is everything, adding things to it. We do this when we think that we're saved by faith and the gospel's various implications. Many things have been added to the gospel throughout history. People add things that may be good, even religious, such as living a moral life, taking care of the poor, or seeing the sacraments of, or the the, um, the ordinances, rather, of baptism and communion as critical for salvation. Now, we're called to be baptized once we're saved. But if I'm not baptized, that doesn't mean I'm not saved. We're called to uh, take communion as, as often as it is offered. We do this in remembrance. It's our way of proclaiming the gospel within the covenant community, within the church. If you don't do it, then that's disobedience. That doesn't mean you're not saved. Okay. Mm-hmm. Any questions about that? No. no. Okay. So if we were to kind of press down the gospel message and give something of a good definition of the gospel, we could say the gospel is the joyful message from God that leads us to salvation. And with that joyful message, there are four questions that are asked of us. Those questions are, Who is God? Why are we in such a mess? What did Christ do? And how can we get back to God? The first question, who is God? Well, the scriptures tell us that God is our creator, according to Genesis 1.1. Let's look at Genesis 1.1 and Job 41.11. While you turn there, I'll read, God is our creator. He is loving, holy, and just. One day he will execute perfect justice against all sin. Genesis 1.1. As you turn to Genesis 1.1, you will notice that at the outset of the Bible, and you could actually go from Genesis to Revelation and find out that what the Bible does not do is attempt to prove the existence of God. 
the Bible merely proclaims that God exists. We see evidences of his existence throughout creation, but the Bible is not trying to like twist your arm into believing. God just exists. God exists and he's communicated and revealed himself in his word and throughout creation. The Bible simply says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Stopping right there. What are the implications of that? Since God has created the heavens and the earth, which is sort of a summary statement of him having created everything. Uh, Verse one of Genesis one is our summary. And then we go down to the subsequent verses. And that explains or shows a distinction of in the days of things that he has created. If God is our creator, that means God is not only our creator, but that means he is our owner. And in being our creator and owner, that makes him supreme over us and makes us accountable to him. I've used this illustration before. If you, you homeowners, were to have a guest come over, to your house and your guests started to attempt to dictate some of the things that were going on in your house like um, I thank you for welcoming, welcoming me into your house you did say make myself at home so well since you said that let me uh, say a few things the furniture has to go okay <laughs> the furniture has to go that's a nice TV but I think um, I'm more partial to Samsung so we need to do something about that um, the flooring I- I'll put you in touch with my guy so we can do something about the flooring here because eh, this this just doesn't work for me you know <laughs> and your response to that would be are you kidding yeah <laughs> Mr. Ronald's eyebrows went up. <laughs> Mama Payne went, yup. Are you kidding? You would say, wait, wait a minute. Let me jog outside. Oh, look at the number on the door. I'm sorry. As I pick up the mail, I don't see your name on any of these bills here. Let me go get the mortgage. I don't see your name. In fact, as I look at the mortgage, it says, this is my house. I'm the one that dictates what's going on in this house. Excuse me. And when we take that illustration and we take a step back and apply that to God, he not only has ownership, but he doesn't have ownership based on a mortgage or bills that he pays. He has ownership because he made it all. Without him, nothing would exist. Without him, nothing would hold together. He's not only creator, but he's lawmaker. And he directs us to be accountable to him. Job 41.11. Job 41.11. Uh, 4111. So this this is actually coming on the heels of Job doing some uh, serious pity party having. This is coming on the heels of Job complaining to the Lord. And it begins actually at chapter 40, verse 6, as uh, the Lord speaks to uh, Job out of the whirlwind. He's not looking to come in some quiet, still voice. He's looking to come and to make his presence known to bring us to a point of pausing and saying, wait a minute. You're God in heaven and here am I on earth. So I need to let my words be few. So as God comes to Job in the whirlwind, I'm actually going to begin at chapter 41, verse 1. And he's asking these series of questions to Job. And with the rapid fire pace that I imagine the questions are coming, 
There's no real expectation of Job saying, well, I got an answer for that. They just seem to be coming in such a way that Job should be coming to the point of saying, I get it. I should be shutting up. He begins in verse 1 of chapter 41. Can you draw out Leviathan with a fish hook or press down his tongue with a cord? Can you put a rope in his nose or pierce his jaw with a hook? Will he make many pleas to you? This is some sort of giant sea beast beyond anything that we could probably fathom. This is larger than your, your regular killer whale. So he's imagining something tremendously uh, um, intimidating. And he's asking if Job can catch this beast with a fish hook. Pausing right there, I, in my early years, um, and I've shared this before, confession's good for the soul, I understand. Mm -hmm. Wasn't a big fan of fishing, still really not a big fan of fishing, but my family would take me and I just liked the family times. So I would always go out and go fishing and I would see my cousin catch big mouth bass, I would see my aunt catch a catfish, and I'd throw out mine, and I'd catch an eel. And then we'd go out fishing some more, and then my cousin would catch some other big fish, and my aunt would catch another big fish, and I'd catch an eel. And so as I imagine Job listening to this, Job is not imagining the catching of a bass the catching of a catfish, and certainly not a catching of an eel. In our mind, we may envision him catching a shark. Some folks, if you're going out, I guess, deep sea fishing, you could possibly, if you got the right equipment, and you're not me because I'm not good at it, (laughs) catching a huge shark. But none of us would imagine someone going out with a fish hook and pulling back orca the killer whale. So if you can imagine how ludicrous it would be for someone to stand by the dock or stand on their big boat and catch a killer whale, imagine something even bigger than that. And that's what God is asking him as he says, can you catch this, this, this beast? He says, will he make many pleas to you? Will he beg to you? Will you speak to you soft words? Oh, please, Mr. Job. Will he make a covenant with you? Oh, Job, if you'll just free me, then I'll. Will he make a covenant with you to take him for your servant forever? Will you play with him as with a bird or would you put him on a leash for your girls? Will you make Leviathan a little pet? Will traders bargain over him? Will they divide him up among the merchants? Can you fill his skin with harpoons or his head with fishing spears? Lay your hands on him. Remember the battle. You will not do it again. Behold, the hope of man is false. He's laid low even at the sight of him. No one is so fierce that he dares to stir him up. Who then is he who can stand before me? I am far greater than a Leviathan. Who is first given to me that I should repay him? Whatever is under the whole heaven is mine. So that's God once again emphasizing that we, we ought to understand our place before him. He is grand creator. He is maker. He is lawgiver. And everything under the whole of creation is his. Therefore, we are accountable to him. Not only is it a matter of who is God, not only does gospel answer the question of who is God, but uh, why are we in this mess? People are made in the image of God, according to Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. We are beautiful and amazing creatures with dignity, worth, and value. But through our willful and sinful rebellion against God, we have turned from being his children to his enemies. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It is our sins that have separated us between God. From I'm sorry, it is our sins that have sep- that have acted as a separation between us and God. Still, all people have the capacity to be restored to a loving relationship with the living God. And how is that done? 
That's when we get into our third question that's answered. Christ is the son of God whose sinless life gave him the ability to become the perfect sacrifice. And I'd like to have a conversation about that for a second here. Immediately when we get into our gospel conversations and throw out our gospel indicatives where we communicate who Christ is and we stop on, well, Christ is the son of God. We'll have opponents to the gospel say, that's right. He's not almighty God. He's just the son of God. He's a little G-O-D. Like in other places where it says that Satan is the God of this world. He's not true God. But we only need to consult the scriptures to clear that thinking up. Because as we go over to the Gospel of John, it will be helpful to us to think with the mindset of those who walked on the earth when Christ was incarnate. We have opponents to the gospel who aren't even honest opponents to the gospel. They don't consider the implications of him calling himself the son of God. When you think about the hatred that the religious leaders had toward Christ, those Jews that opposed him, you understand that they would, at the bare minimum, be honest with what they understood to be true about the scriptures as well as what Christ was saying when he said that he was the son of God. Looking at the Gospel of John, chapter 5. And let me begin at verse 13 to give something of a context. It says, Now the man who had been healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn. This is the man who was blind who was healed. I'm sorry, the man who was an invalid, take up your bed and walk, who was healed. Now, the man who had been healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn as there was a crowd in the place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, see, you are well, sin no more. The implication of you entering in at the door and being made well is that you're not to live a life of sin. You're not to live a life of willful sin, you see. You have the door, the entry, as well as the pattern of life. Sin no more. That nothing worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. And this is why the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, my father is working until now and I am working. What was their response to this? Oh, by him saying, my father, he's indicating that he's the son of God. Therefore, he's a little G.O.D. and not to be concerned about. No, their response was, this is why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. Because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself what? Equal Equal with God. So you have opponents to say, well, Jesus never said he was God. Really? He's presenting himself as being equal with God. The implication of that is he's saying that he's God. He's saying that he's God. So when we share with folks the identity of Christ, namely that he is the son of God, God the son, it is not with a heart cringing that we share this. We're not intimidated by that because when Christ says he's God, or rather the Son of God, he is just doing that. He's saying he's God. So Christ, the Son of God, whose sinless life gave him the ability to become the perfect sacrifice, we're helped in our understanding of him being the perfect sacrifice or being sinless as we look over at Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 and 15, as it says, Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who is in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Presenting him as the sinless one. So this one who's a sinless one, we find that through his death on the cross, he ransomed sinful people. 
meaning he purchased them off the slave block of sin. He drew them away from their former state of condemnation. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 26 says that, as well as chapter 10, verses 10 through 14, speaking of his death. Christ's death paid for sins of all who come to him in faith. Christ's resurrection from the dead is the ultimate vindication of these truths. So that leads us to the fourth question. What's the fourth question? How can we get back to God? That's our response. The response God requires from us is to acknowledge our sin, repent and believe in Christ. So we turn from sin, especially from the sin of unbelief, and turn to God in faith and with the understanding that we will follow him for the rest of our days. That, beloved, is the gospel. That's the simple message of the gospel. That's the clear message of the gospel. Not leaving out who God is. Creator, owner, maker, lawgiver, supreme. Therefore, I am accountable. Not leaving out who we are, considering our former state. We are people created in the image of God, though we are now no, though we have now a marred image of God upon us, because it's spotted and stained and corrupted by sin. And so therefore we need someone to stand in the gap, that is Jesus Christ, God the Son, the perfect and sinless one, whose death was for sin. And so that leads us to a required response: repent and believe. Again, that brings us back to our definition that speaks to teaching the gospel with an aim at persuasion. So the question will be now is, what about methods? I hear that. You dealt with that last time, but what about methods? Well, the first method that we want to give ourselves to is the method of prayer. Prayer is number one. The Bible teaches us that the work of salvation is God's. It is God's and God's alone. He is the one who changes the heart. You remember Jonah when he was in the belly of the giant fish, how he came to the end of himself because he was this guy who figured that, okay, you're going to send me to Nineveh, these hateful, horrible people. They're not worthy of salvation. I'm going in the complete. You want me to go over there? I'm going in the complete opposite direction. God said, that's where you're wrong because I have an appointment with a fish or rather you have one. And so he sent the fish to swallow him and take him back in that direction. And it was from the belly of the fish that we find Jonah praying in chapter two, verse nine and saying salvation is the Lord's. It's like, oh, my bad, I forgot. I'm sorry. You're supreme and I'm accountable. Salvation is the Lord's. Not only do we pray because of this sort of epiphany that uh, Jonah had that says the salvation comes from the Lord, but we see the Lord Jesus Christ modeling this for us when we look at John 17. And he's praying for those who would believe in who he is. Believe in the 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 uh, the uniqueness of his person. He's 100 percent God, 100 percent man and the majesty of his work that by his death, he has extinguished all sin that we would ever commit and drawn us into a position of being accepted into the household of God. So Jesus prays for those who would embrace that truth. We find Christ praying. But not only do we find Christ praying, when we look over at Romans chapter 10, we find the Apostle Paul praying. We find Paul saying things like, brothers, my heart desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. Paul, one of the greatest minds, mortal minds that ever walked this earth, one of the greatest evangelists, theologians. And yet we find him praying and not employing something like the sinner's bench. He's trusting God to bring about the transformation. We can take away this thought under the heading of prayer. We can work and witness for the salvation of someone, but only God can finally bring it about. It is his work, so we must pray. First method before we even launch out as we pray. Okay, having launched out, having gotten ourselves into these gospel saturated conversations, what do we do? What is another indispensable ingredient? We use our Bible. 
Use the Bible. Pray. Use the Bible. The Bible is not just for public preaching and private devotions, but it's for us to take and refer our friends to it. Because as we are referring our friends to maybe the Gospel of Mark, unveiling who Christ is as this servant, or maybe the Gospel of John, showing him as to be God of very God, it's us showing them as God has presented it in black and white, the truth of the gospel as opposed to us seeming like we're presenting our ideas and our opinions and our notions. This is how you crack the hard shell of the skeptic. You let God communicate the truth of himself to the heart of the lost. Okay? So we pray, we use the Bible, and we strive to be clear. There's a theological term or rather... It's not theological. There's a complicated sociological evangelistic term that people tend to use because it's in vogue now. They say you need to conceptualize the gospel. What does that mean? That means whatever context you're in, you're aware of the folks that you're talking to. You don't necessarily use the same language that you would use with folks who have been in the assembly, the church, all of their lives because they may not understand the terms that you're using. So you reach them at their point of understanding. Throughout contextualization, that word, and, and it's just basically us saying, be clear. Be clear. So I'm not coming to the guy on the street and say, well, you know that... Christ, by Christ's substitutionary sacrifice, he has propitiated the wrath of the Father. And you know what has happened with your sin? Expiation. Yeah, that's right, expiation. You know what I'm talking about with expiation? Furthermore, when you believe in Christ, uh, 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 you are justified. There is the doctrine of justification, thereby reconciliation, and all of that, and it takes you to the consummation. <laughs> and people are like... All right, could you just give me the track and walk away, please? <laughs> so it's not that we take those truths and say, well, we can't use them anymore. But instead, we define our terms. There's one um, writer I was reading, I think it was Mark Dever's book, and he was saying, he was asking a friend of his, a Jewish friend, he was like, um, um, I'm working on this paper on evangelism. Has anyone ever evangelized you? And his friend said, I don't, I'm not sure. What is that? And so he was like, you know, when someone um, tells you about who Christ is and who you are without him and your need for him um, and what he's done on your behalf. It's like, yeah, I, I suppose I have had that happen. And Pastor Mark Dever kind of backed up and thought about it. He was like, of course he'd had that happen. I had evangelized him for many years and many times. It was just that in that moment, Pastor Deborah was reminded that in the times of sharing the truth of who God is with him, he had not defined his terms. And therefore, the person didn't understand what was taking place. So when we speak to folks about the gospel, we speak in a way as to be understood. When we talk about justification, we make sure that we define the term. We say that justification is the whole idea of being declared right. Being declared right. That's not hard. You go to court. You stand before the judge. The judge binds the gavel and says not guilty. Because maybe the information was, was not, not complete enough. Maybe the, 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 the lawyers didn't, didn't prove their case. The prosecuting attorney didn't prove their case. So by the judge saying that you're not guilty, he hasn't gone back in time and removed you as one of the people that was there looting and burning CVS. He hasn't done that. He's just declared you as being righteous, right, not guilty. That's justification. But justification, according to uh, what the Bible says, goes beyond that. Because not only does God declare you righteous... He's declaring you righteous because Christ has given you credit for his righteousness. Isn't that much better? And you can be clear about that. Not only that, but we have to be clear about the fact of sin. The scripture says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The scripture says that 
Uh, God is of purer eyes than to look in a favorable way upon evil. Back at chapter 1, verse 13. We need to be clear that our sins, as I've alluded to before, have separated us from God. And all oh, we like sheep have gone astray and we've turned every one to, to our own way. And also what we find in Isaiah 59, as it says in the first two verses, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save, nor his ear dull, that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have made, as I've alluded to multiple times, your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, hidden his presence from you, so that he does not hear. That goes right in the face of those that says we're all God's children. And God says, no, I don't hear you. There's a separation between the two of us. We're not cool. You're not okay. And what does that tell you? That tells you that we have an offensive message. Just go ahead and embrace that now. You can attempt to make Christianity as least offensive as possible, but it'll be offensive if you're honest. Maybe you go the vague route. Maybe you say, well, would you like to accept Jesus in your heart today? And the person may say something along the lines of, why not? What do I need to do to get him from there and into my heart? Tell me so you can stop talking to me about it. Okay, I believe. Leave me alone. That's a far different gospel. That's a gospel that's not the gospel because you've done nothing to tell them about a holy God and the fact that you've offended him. There's nothing in that message that says that you must repent and believe and that God will judge. That's a gospel that's gospel. That's something that you find yourself spending more time explaining what it means to get omnipresent God squeezed down into the heart of an individual. So not only do we need to be clear about the fact of sin, but we must be clear about the meaning of the cross, namely that it is the instrument that God has applied to save us. It is Christ taking the responsibility and the brunt of wrath in our place. And we again must be clear about our need to repent. That brings me down to a next point. We must be honest. We must pray. We must use the Bible. We must be clear. We must be honest. That involves telling people that they must repent. That involves telling people that as a result of the fall, we then did not become neutral. All of humanity after Adam fell is not on neutral standing. Everyone coming into this world is lost and fallen and in a position of enmity and hatred before God. You may think, well, I don't have a problem with God. Okay, well, newsflash, he has a problem with you. And he's going to judge you. Therefore, we have to repent. And what is repentance? Repentance is turning from the sins you love to the holy God you're called to love. It is admitting that you're not God. Turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. It is beginning to value Jesus more than your immediate pleasure. It is giving up on those things the Bible calls sin and leaving them to follow Jesus. 1 Thessalonians Chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, as Paul is speaking to the saints at the church of Thessalonica, he says, For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you, how you turn to God. Repentance is a turning, turning away from sin, turning to God. You turn to God from idols to serve the living God the living and true God, and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. What is repentance? Repentance is turning. So we pray, we use our Bibles, we be clear, we be honest, and we be normal. Be normal. Yes, I said be normal. 
That goes along with honesty, but I gotta say be normal because we have some of the most interesting way of modeling out our Christianity before people. Instead of communicating the gospel as it is written down in scripture, you tell people these marketing, these, these marketing oriented ideas that, you know, ever since I came to faith in Christ, my bank account has been full. Oh. Ever since I came to faith in Christ, no, ever since I came to faith in Christ, my kids have been doing better in school. That hip pain I had, baby, it is gone. I, I got some extra money. I can go on a retreat. Where do you find that in the Bible? Or you'll say things like, well, you know, the joy of the Lord is my strength. I don't even get upset anymore. When I go outside, I see the sun in a different light. <laughs> the air is crisper and cleaner. You can't appreciate the beauty of creation without the gospel. Won't you accept them today? You'll be happier. You'll be healthier. You have more money. That's an unreal and untrue description of the gospel. <laughs> Consider this example. There was a young lady who desperately wanted her sister to come to faith. She struggled in witnessing to her because over the years, their relationship with one another had become distant. They grew up pretty much pretty close, but they went their separate ways later in life as one became a believer and the other became a skeptic. Years later, the skeptical sister, and we'll call her Susie, Susie skeptic, came to live with the Christian sister. We'll call her Chrissy Christian. <clears throat> Chrissy worried about being able to share her faith with her sister. She wanted to be bold about her faith, but she felt inadequate to do so because she struggled with doubts and questions at various points in her Christian walk. So she went to her pastor. We'll call her pastor, Pastor Novell, if you don't mind. We'll see about that. <laughs> her pastor encouraged her to use sharing her doubts as a means of starting the conversation. Her pastor, we'll call him Pastor Knowswell. Pastor Knowswell. Tell her, and I quote, about your struggles, he said, to which she gasped. I can't do that. I want her to believe. I want her to know the truth of the gospel. The pastor responded. So you want your skeptical sister to believe in a way that you yourself do not believe. Have you ever considered that the way you present yourself as a Christian might be part of the reason your sister doesn't believe? You live out an untrue faith. You model a fake Christianity because you pretend that as a result of becoming saved, the storms of life never reach you. And what do you do to your friends and people that see your life? You create people who are skeptics. Failing to be normal and honest about our struggles in the faith causes us to distort the gospel. It puts up false barriers in the way uh, those who are so anxious, excuse me, it puts up false barriers between us and those who are anxious to evangelize. I'm going to use this as an example. Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18. We look over at Luke chapter 18. It does not necessarily perfectly model it, but the principle is nonetheless there. Luke chapter 18, verses 11 and 12 are our focus, but I'm going to start at verse 9. As it says, he also told this parable, Jesus telling a parable, to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee standing by himself by, by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. Um, pardon the finger as I pointed him. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all I get. This guy had this false idea of righteousness that he always lived a pristine, perfect Christian life, so to speak, or a, a perfect, Christ, uh, pristine uh, a life before the living God. And as we take careful inventory of ourselves, 
we know that that's not the truth of us. But there are times where we attempt to model or communicate that to folks we want to evangelize. You come to faith in Christ, you'll be just as fake as me. I mean, you'll just be just as perfect and living perfectly under the sun as me. And as a result of that falsehood, you stir up skeptics. Um, The next one, and I only have three more counting this one. Be respectful. The focus of evangelism is not to be whatever is easy for us, but the particular person to whom we're speaking that goes hand in hand with be clear. So as I'm looking to share the gospel, I may not necessarily come with the same cookie cutter, formulaic message. I listen to the individual. I hear where they are. They may be struggling because they lost a loved one. And in the course of saying that they lost a loved one, you may not go with this large, well, you know, God created the heavens and the earth and he is owner and maker. And you may not start there. You may start with, I can identify the pain that you're feeling. And I, I, I understand that, you know, I've, I've suffered the loss too. And when I think about all of the, the painful things in this world, I'm reminded that this world is not the way that it was intended to be. The ugly things that we face on a daily basis, the painful, heart-wrenching things that we face on a daily basis is not the way God intended. At this point, you may even go into saying, if you don't mind, I'd like to share with you what the scriptures say about your pain and how God can heal it and give you a different perspective and outlook on it. You see, the pain you feel, Christ died for that pain. The death, the, the death of your loved one is as a result of the corruption of sin that falls on all men. And Christ died to cleanse us and the creation itself of sin. And by his death, it communicates to us that we are in need of a savior. Namely, we're outside of a right relationship with him. And so we have to identify with the fact that we're spotted by sin and trust in the one who's able to save us. See that? I didn't give you the same message that I had given you earlier. By being respectful, I am a listener to the person in who, uh, to whom I'm communicating. I listen first, treating them with respect and dignity and meeting them as a unique individual and not as a notch on my belt. How many souls you win this week? 99, I think. I gave out 99 tracks. At least 99, I will say. <laughs> Second, because of this uniqueness, this unique, the uniqueness of this person and because of the differing circumstances of each person's life, history and every individual we meet is at different stages in their spiritual journey from every other person. You may meet up with a person who was previously in the church but became disenchanted by the church because these things were communicated to be the gospel. And these pressures were put on them and you say, well... That's not what I understand the gospel to be. And they say, well, what do you mean? I grew up in the church. My mama took me to the church every week. Four or five times a week. I was on like nine choirs. I know the gospel. (laughs) And you identify with that person and you take them to the scriptures and say, well, this is what the Bible says the gospel is. So you're meeting that person at a different place than maybe the other person. You're listening and meeting them at their point of need. Third, we know that our Heavenly Father loves people far more than we do, and it is our Heavenly Father that will draw them to Christ. So we act in a way that is faithful. We act in a way that's respectful. And I have to emphasize the respectful part, because I know that when I get into some conversations with folks who are either claiming to be Christians, but they're heretics, or claiming that they're saved, And have the true God, but they're in a cult. I find myself drawing a line. Step over that line. And I'm ready for a fight. But in the course of taking that sort of mindset, there are times where I've been less than 
respectful. And so there are a couple of verses of scripture that come to me. To help me to correct that in my next endeavors. Colossians chapter 4 verse 6. In light of time I'm going to read a lot of these so I can come to an end. Colossians chapter 4 verse 6 it says let your communication, let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. It's a message that says that we ought to be respectful in our communication and our discussions. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 15 and 16. But in your hearts, honor Christ, the Lord is holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason, asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. And folks usually stop there. But the verse continues, as it says, yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience. So that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. They'll revile you because of the truth and not because you are the ugly Christian in presenting the truth. So be respectful. Last two, provoke self-reflection. Provoke self-reflection. A part of provoking self-reflection is asking good questions. There's not... Every conversation about the gospel does not mean necessarily that you have to be the one put on a defensive. And this has been extremely helpful to me over the years. Whether I'm talking to someone who's in another faith or talking to someone or whoever I'm talking to, I want to be able to ask them good questions. Well, okay, so you, you worship where? Okay. So when you think about God, well, could you tell me who you believe God to be and our standing before God? You believe God is a holy God? You believe God is a holy God, but you're now telling me that there are certain things that I can do to win God's approval. So that as God sees me as a sinner, if I do all of these things going door to door or kneeling and facing the the east, and praying five times a day, then I'm going to be saved. He's just going to overlook everything that I did. The God you described just gave me a pass. He's not holy, he's unholy. Christianity has a different. The God who actually exists has a different. The sins that I committed are going to be paid for one way or another. Either I'm going to pay for them or my substitute's going to pay for them. Christ is our substitute. He pays for our sins. So as I'm communicating the gospel message to uh, maybe a friend or family member or someone I've had a relationship with uh, for a while, I may get them to expound on questions about life, about uh, uh, God, about how they understand where bad things came from in the world. So I want to ask self-reflecting questions. Another way that I can ask self-reflecting questions is um, I can ask someone, well, what do you think a real Christian is? That's a really good question to ask. The reason is, is because people have all sorts of differing definitions of what a real Christian is. And you're able to listen to that description and say, well, that's not what the Bible says about a Christian at all. A real Christian isn't someone that walks around with a halo over their head. A real Christian I get what you feel about church and you say, well, there's more hypocrites in there. Yeah, we get that. That's why we in church, because we need we know we need help. We hypocrites. <laughs> what about I mean, you know, I'm not being offensive, but what about you? In our conversation, you said that you've lied. You said that you stole. You said that you thought things sinful. Aren't you a hypocrite if you don't go to correct those things? Or you may say, well, <laughs> Another uh, provoking one is um, you could ask the question of, have you personally trusted in Jesus or are you still on the way? And that's a leading question that kind of gets someone feeling like that they're getting off the hook. 
Because then they expect to be able to say, well, I haven't really trusted in Jesus just yet. I've been to VBS and everything, (laughs) and I met Mr. Marshall. He did the games and everything. It was cool. I guess you could say I'm still on the way. And you could say, well, you know, that's that's interesting. Um, How far along the way are you? (laughs) That keeps the conversation going. Or you may happen upon someone who uh, says that they're a Christian or says that I'm, I'm okay. And you say, well, you're okay? He's like, oh, okay. Well, can I ask you a series of questions? Yes, you may. Would you consider yourself a good person? Yes, I would consider myself a good person. Do you think you've kept the, the Ten Commandments? As I think about it, you know what? I've kept the Ten Commandments. <laughs> if you were to base, if God were to judge you based on the Ten Commandments, would you be guilty or innocent? Well, I think I would be innocent. Really? Okay, so have you ever tell, told a lie in your life? Any lie. little white lie, a little fudging on the taxes so you can get a couple more dollars. Have you ever uh, told a lie to protect someone's feelings because you don't like hurting people's feelings? Well, yes, I have. Well, what do you call a person that's told a lie? A liar. Okay, so if you're a liar, then you've broken the ninth commandment. Have you ever seen someone that looked so good and you wasn't married to them that you wanted them and you didn't want to give them a high five? You 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 wanted them, you know, and I ain't gonna get the scripture. The scripture. Yeah, you know what? In fact, I'm I'm thinking about a little shorty right now. Really? You've broken the seventh commandment because you've committed adultery in your heart. <laughs> Have you ever uh, been uh, working somewhere and you got frustrated on the job and you said? Mm. It's like, yeah, I said that. In fact, I'm about to say it after this conversation because you're getting on my nerves. <laughs> really? So you've used God's name in vain and you're going to do it later on? I sure am. Well, if you have in the past and if you're planning to do so, then you have, would have broken the third commandment called blasphemy. So you've described yourself as a liar, an adulterer, and a blasphemer. You've broken the commandments of God. So if you were to stand before God as a lawbreaker, would you be um, accepted in heaven or would you go to hell? I guess I would be going to hell. Do you want to go to hell? Well, if you don't want to go to hell, let me tell you the gospel of Jesus Christ. So those are just a few thought provoking questions. And I guess the last one after self-reflection is use the church. Use the church. What do I mean by use the church? I mean that our Christianity is lived out within the confines of the covenant community. The Bible knows nothing of a renegade 007 off on your own ranger Christian. The Bible knows nothing of folks that says go through them four walls I am the church. No, the Bible says you are a member of the church. Chances are you're a finger, a fingernail, toenail, something else. You are a member of the body of Christ. You're not the church all to yourself. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 through 25 speaks to us of not forsaking the assembling together. Now, folks will say, well, I can assemble with people. We had fight night over my house and I had Christians over. No, because the context of the passage is speaking to people within corporate worship. Within formal corporate worship within the church. In Hebrews chapter 13, verses 7, 17, and 24, it speaks of obeying or submitting To your leaders. And it's talking about your religious leaders. It's talking about your pastor. You don't go to a church. How are you fulfilling your responsibility of what Hebrews chapter 13 says, where it says to submit to the authority of your leaders? It presupposes church membership. You look at the Acts passages, Acts chapter 2, verses 41 and 42, as well as verse 47. And in All of those verses, it speaks of people being evangelized, getting saved, and then they being added to the number of the church. It presupposes that there was some role out there, some church role that they were being added to. Not just being brought into the spiritual body of Christ, but actually a part of the church. 
Use the church. Our memory verse talking about going out and making disciples. Teaching them. That's a present participle. That's a continuous, ongoing action. You're teaching them. If you hand someone a track and then say, all right, then. Not embracing the responsibility of discipling them. Or, or provoking some measure of growth. Then you're not fulfilling the Great Commission. If you're not fulfilling the Great Commission, you're not being obedient. If you're not being obedient, then, well, you know. And that's not what we want to have. We want to have a culture of evangelism. A culture of evangelism that allows us to have conversations with folks. And in the course of having conversations with people, we can be clear about what the gospel says. We don't have to come up with formulas to trick people up in conversations. We can listen to them. And in the course of listening to them, God will give us a space of grace to share the gospel. That's why part of our methodology is prayer. Because you're praying, God, make me sensitive to those open opportunities that I have to share the gospel. So that this person that uh, could one day die will be ushered into our family. That not only would they have the eyes of faith, but their faith would then be their eyes when they one day stand before you. That's what we want. A culture of evangelism that, has, that, that leads us to having intentional conversations where we can communicate the gospel clearly, no matter what the situation is. And I'm well, well, well over my time. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you, Lord, for the opportunity that we had to walk through these truths. I pray, Father, that they were both encouraging, enlightening, and exhortive to your people. I pray, Lord, that you would use them, that they might be life within us, that you would seal them to our hearts, and that you would mobilize us into action. This I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.